I think it's uh, 80 years tomorrow afternoon since I first went to a Saturday meeting. I was four years of age, so I guess how old I am. <laughs> and uh, I remember 60 years ago spending an afternoon with the most distinguished woman preacher in the world. Her name was uh, Catherine Booth. She was the daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army, William Booth. But just a few uh, weeks ago, I spent uh, some time, my precious Martha, with a woman that I think is the most anointed woman in the world today. She hasn't, she hasn't owned a penny. She hasn't got two dresses. Nobody on her staff owns a car. She lives in a room 15 feet by 15. Her bathroom is four feet by four with a toilet there. She has a, a little tap, a, a drip of water as big as your finger. She catches water in it and warms it, puts some soap on her head and throws the water over her head and that's the shower she has. The Queen the other day, when she was in, uh, where was she, in Miami, <coughs> she didn't drop in to see us, but anyhow, she helped Mr. Sh what, what do you call him, Schwarzkopf? Schwarzkopf? Can't say it. She gave him a knighthood. Well, she doesn't give that to ladies. She gives them an MBE, a member of the British Empire, and she gave that MBE to Jackie Pullinger, who I think is the most anointed woman in the world today. I mean, to listen to her. We started our meeting with 2,500 people. In three days, we had 9,000 people there in the civic center in Anaheim. And uh, she just reduced the whole place to tears and brokenness. There was no thunder and shouting and drawing and voting and all that business. But one thing amongst others that, she, that really stuck in my heart was this. Uh, she said there's only one place in the world where today they're having revival. Do you know where it is? It's in America. God's left America long ago. We million dollar crusades and nothing happens. We've had million dollar crusades for 25 years. You can't tell me one city that's had revival through them. We have 500 evangelists in America. We don't have one revivalist. Evangelists seek popularity. Prophets shun it. The thing was this. Well, she said, uh, they're having revival in China, okay. And this is a country, remember, that Mr. Bush is trying to get us to link up with. And she says, our young people, look at these young ladies here tonight. They go down the street, they go to a gospel meeting and disappear and they haven't been seen since. The communists keep gathering up truck, uh, van loads of young people and take them away. They disappear. No politician is going to say that. I'd tell Mr. Bush if I got half a chance. But we want some cheap cotton or something from over there. We've nothing to take over there. In fact, some of the people over there say, don't bring us American evangelism. One man said recently, young Americans come over here, they show it, they bring their guitars, they sing for three days, and back they go to America and live in luxury. But Jackie, you stayed with us. And she said, I'm looking at the walls. She said, uh, a man came out of prison recently. He'd been there 27 years for preaching the gospel. And when he came out, his, his face was the color of the wall. He had been in solitary confinement for years. And uh, people sent news ahead that he's coming back to his village. He didn't have a Bible under his arm. He didn't have a little cassette. He just walked down the village street and the whole village came and repented. They knelt in the street and cried to God. There's a Christian. There's a man who for 26 years had been in prison. He's been beaten, he's been without food, he's been without, he's been in solitary confinement, and yet the glory of God is on him. You see, we want to get the glory of God by coming to a meeting. She almost scorns those of us who go from meeting to meeting to meeting. I tell you, when I listened to that woman, I felt like, well, I had to follow her preaching, as a matter of fact. And I've never felt as, uh, well, I always feel unworthy preaching anyhow, but to follow that amazing woman, I'll tell you how it happened. She was English, as you would imagine, 
and uh, she said to a vicar in the Church of England, I'm tired of giving a dollar for missions, I'm tired of stand up, sit down, say a prayer, do something, what shall I do? And off the cuff he said, get on a boat and wherever it stops, get off and stay the rest of your life. She did that. Nineteen years of age, playing a classical oboe in the, what do you call it, the um, Philharmonic there. And uh, <coughs> little thinking that what that uh, old bow was going to mean anyhow, uh, let me say this, <coughs> she got on the boat, it stopped here, it stopped there, stopped at Singapore, stopped somewhere else, then it stopped in Hong Kong and she got off the boat, she was 19 years of age, she's still there at 44. She goes to the guttermost. Martha said to her in our house, uh, Jackie, what's the most difficult thing you've had? She smiles so sweetly and she said, Martha, I'm a very public person. I love people, I love people, but I love quietness. My biggest difficulty when I went to Hong Kong was to share my bedroom for 18 years with prostitutes. Sometimes 12, 12 of them on the floor, sometimes half a dozen men, sometimes criminals, the most wicked men that there are. But she so lived there that people say, if you want to see a Christian, go see Jackie. I say, when I was talking to her, I was thinking when I, I sat with the uh, daughter of William Booth, uh, she was about 20 years of age, she wasn't very athletic, she had a curvature of the spine that she inherited from her mother, and William Booth, of course, used to kick everybody to the ends of the earth, but he said to his children, don't you go. So Catherine, the second Catherine, said, I'm going to France. She went to the underworld of France and rented a building there and within three weeks had revival. Professors from the Sorbonne were there, these long bearded wise men of the world. Prostitutes were there. Men would come to the altar, take daggers out of the socks, take guns out of the socks and kneel there and weep. And there these titled ladies of England left their stately homes you see, there's one thing that's more attractive than anything, and on God's name I tell you this, you never have to advertise a fire, whether it's in a man, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a community. All we need is men and women on the fire. We don't need more money. We don't need more organization. We don't need broken, bankrupt actors to come and sit on the platform of our conferences. Forget it. Let's go back to God. Well, there's my introduction. Shall I preach now? <laughs> I could talk all night about Jackie, but I won't. Let me give you a text and uh, do something with it from the second letter of Peter. Second Peter chapter 1. Have you got it now? I'm reading from the uh, NIV, the never improved version, King James. <laughs> King James, the never improved version, there it is, NIV. <laughs> oh, you just woke up, thank you. <laughs> At least you're asleep, you're not asleep. Second letter of Peter. Chapter 1 and verse 20. And knowing this first, that prophecy of the scriptures of no private inter interpretation, for prophecy came not in the old time by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You get that? What are prophets? Prophets are holy men. Prophets are lowly men. Prophets are lonely men. Prophets are direct. Prophets are daring. Prophets are difficult. In the last two years I've traveled much of the country in conferences uh, up to eight or nine thousand people with some of the most famous so-called prophets in the world today. Then people say, do we have any prophets like Jeremiah? No, we don't. These are prophets of God. You see, the little church I went to in England, 
they taught what was very popular in England at the time. They used to make the difference and say this, and I've heard it on TV and you have years ago, the difference between the Holy Spirit in the Old Testament and the Holy Spirit in the New Testament, in the Old Testament he was with them and in the New Testament he was in them. That's not true. Look at the first epistle of Peter and the first chapter. Verse 9, 1 Peter 1 verse 9 Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls of which salvation the prophets have inquired such diligently and prophesied of the grace that should be unto you searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them the Spirit was in them then look for a moment at the third chapter of Acts and verse 22 <coughs> is that verse? I think it is No, that's not the text I wanted. Which minutes? Yes, I'll find it now. Acts 3.22, okay. Moses, listen, Moses truly said unto you, A prophet, your Lord, your God, shall raise up of your brethren like unto me. Isn't that astounding? If Jesus said that, if Jesus said there was a prophet like me and his name was Moses, that would be one thing. But God says here's a man called Moses and there'll be somebody raised up eventually who is like Moses. What was Moses? He was an intercessor. He prayed like no other man that ever lived except Jesus. But let's go back again to that verse in Second Peter 1. Holy men of God spake, did you get this? As they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Do you remember that story in Acts 26, is it 27? Where Paul was on a ship and there were 270 people on it and the ship got in trouble and they threw out the baggage, they threw out the lifeboat, they threw out everything they have. It's a type of the church that's in darkness and going into further darkness. We're going to throw everybody overboard. Three years from now your money won't be worth a dime, not even the gold you've stashed away. We're going into the greatest tribulation the world has ever known and the church isn't ready for it. And my prayer is the same as dear Joyce tonight. I mean, I, I should be in Hong Kong tonight actually. I should go from Hong Kong to Taiwan, Taiwan to uh, New Zealand, New Zealand to somewhere else. But I'm where God wants me and that's all that matters to me tonight. To be here where God is, to say something, to share something which is superior, important to you. God is looking for men and women full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. But it says that when they couldn't do anything with that ship, it says, well, we let her drive. That same word in the Greek is used here, moved by the Holy Ghost. How does the Holy Ghost move? Does it say in the beginning he moved over the face of the earth? There was darkness over the face of the earth, there was chaos, and out of chaos he brought cosmos. What about these men here? What did he do with men like uh, Zechariah? What did he do with men like Elijah? What did he do with men like um, Isaiah? These were awesome men. You see, we have such a petty idea of the Holy Ghost. We don't know God. I'm going to speak either tomorrow night or Sunday morning, I don't know which, on a message God gave me. You see, I was taught as a little boy in England and I got a lot of wisdom there. Uh, man proposes but God disposes. Now last year I was ready to go to London to preach in the London Arena at 11,000 people a night. A friend of mine rented it for 168,000 for four days. We're going to have three meetings a day 
and I anticipated going because people were coming from Australia, New Zealand, India, uh, all the evangelical preachers of Europe were going to be there and then suddenly I didn't feel well enough to go so I said well I'm not going but then I wanted to know why did God not let me go because I don't go to a meeting and preach I'm not on hire I'm not a taxi cab so I come here this weekend it took me three men months to prepare if you give me a hundred thousand dollars you won't pay me it took me six months to prepare to go for six days and then the Lord said no so that's okay so I waited on God and he gave me this word holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost the other thing he gave me which I'll share tomorrow night or Sunday morning as it was in the days of Noah do you know this is the most peri this is the most critical crisis America or the world has ever been in what's it say in the Bible in the last days there'll be what's the scripture you say Martha uh, without um, Martha remember in minutes uh, what, 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 with, with, uh, with no exits without oh perplexity what's the scripture though I've forgotten even where it is I've, one of those blanks came up right now okay but it talks about the last days there'll be uh, troubles in the world anyhow without without with perplexities in, in other words there's no way out there's no way out why in God's name are we bowing the knee to Gorbachev he's the bloodiest man in the world he supervised the rape of uh, Afghanistan for 10 years he supervised the rape of Romania for the few years that they had power he was behind the terrible massacre in Tanenium Square last year in China he got his legs under the table in the White House for the first time in history right before him all the homosexuals had a meal there that's never happened in history going downhill how much quicker can we go there's only one answer to the situation in the world today not just America but the world and that's the Holy Ghost revival if we don't do that we'll have the biggest bloodshed in history and so I, I trust you give attention to what God wants us to hear tonight holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost uh, well as I say I, di I didn't go to that meeting but I was on a plane with Martha in January of this year going to the conference in New York and I uh, no yeah, no 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 conference in New York conference in California and uh, I just looked out of the plane I saw what looked like sheets and sheets or acres or miles and miles of snow and I, I nudged Martha I said darling look at this snow and then the captain said look to the right window and you'll see the white sands of New Mexico and I thought boy they look beautiful and just like that this text came into my mind moved by the Holy Ghost and then a most stupendous thing Look at the gospel recorded by Luke for a minute, will you? What would happen to you? Come on, friend, let me ask you a question. Supposing as you were getting ready this morning, packing your bag or putting gas in your car, an angel came and stood to the side of you and began to communicate would you, would you ask for its visa? would you say are you really an angel? we're not used to seeing angels well here it says in the first chapter of the gospel recorded by Saint Luke now look at verse 28 the angel came in unto her and said hail thou art highly favored the Lord is with thee isn't that something an angel comes from heaven to tell a young woman the Lord is with thee but wait a minute look at verse 35 the Holy Ghost will come upon thee 
and the power of the highest should overshadow thee. That holy thing which should be born of thee should be called the Son of God. Come on! How many times have you read that and it doesn't mean that much to you? This young woman wakes up in the morning, she's an ordinary woman. A womb is empty. The Holy Ghost comes upon her and at night time her womb is filled with God. What do you think she felt like? She goes to her boyfriend and says, Joseph, I've got something to tell you, darling. And he, and he, he says, what? Is it very important because I'm, I've got something to do? It's, no, 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 no. This, I, 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 nobody in history has ever had this. What do you mean? She says, have you ever read the ninth chapter? Have you heard the rabbi, uh, the pre high priest in the temple reading the ninth chapter of Isaiah where it says a virgin shall be with child? He says, well, darling, I've heard that a hundred times. She said, well, I'm that, I'm that one. No, she didn't say that. She wasn't allowed to say it. What do you think he thought as her belly begins to swell? She gets bigger and bigger and bigger and says, well, I want to ask you, but I, I didn't ask you. She said, well, I can't tell you anything. I can't tell you anything. And then she goes from him and she has to tell the high priest. Can you imagine the gossip? Listen, do you think you're going to get the Holy Ghost to revolutionize your life and stay in the status quo? If you say you're in a meeting tonight and in the mercy of God he moves you and you say tomorrow, last night God moved on me uh, in that meeting, it changed my life. Listen, there's only one proof of that, it changes your lifestyle. You can't store it in your mind because you get to know a bit more about the Holy Ghost than last meeting you were at. God didn't ask you to be a walking library, he asked you to be a God-filled personality. What do you think was in Jerusalem? Somebody says, hey, I want to tell you something. You won't believe this, you know, all these soldiers that camped around, and there were at that time, hundreds of soldiers camped around Jerusalem. And you know Mary, which Mary? There's a hundred Marys go to the temple. You know, Holy Mary, you know, the one who always goes in the corner. She always prays with that woman a hundred years of age, Hannah. Isn't that something? A woman went to church every day of her life for 80 years and never got tired? That Simeon went and prayed every day. All the old people go up in that corner. There's old Simeon with his long beard, living his eyes. I'm not going to die till I see the salvation of God. Do you know, in the last three years, people have come from seven different areas, nearly as many countries, to my office. And without knowing it, each of them have told me, you're Simeon. You're not going to die till revival comes. Well, that's great. I'm willing to hang around a couple more years. Just as long as Social Security doesn't run out. <laughs> no, I don't have a newsletter. If I want it, it's okay. I'm trying to trust the Lord anyhow. Well, what's the news? Well, you know, my, my, uh, my brother-in-law is friendly with a high priest. And he says that Mary, you know little Mary, of course, all kinds of girls are getting pregnant with all these soldiers around about, but Mary, Mary says she's carrying a baby and Joseph isn't the father. What? She's, she's let Joseph down? No, no, no. She just says, no man did this. I've had no meeting with a man at all. Well, she adds blasphemy to it. She says God did this. You get filled with the Holy Ghost, you lose a lot of your friends, and then you have to say, God did this. That's not one way to get rid of your husband, by the way. But we don't think of that, do we? The Holy Ghost should come up. Do you think she knew that the Holy Ghost had come upon her? Do you think she got up next morning with her hands on her tummy and saying, the Christ of God is in me? I'm the only woman in history that would ever have this privilege. That's wonderful. Maybe she didn't sleep for a night or two. But the go gossip is round town. Oh, Mary, I saw today, you know, she smiles and she's so gracious and, you know, she acts as though she doesn't even know what's happening and she's pregnant. A single girl like her. I've always told my daughter, I hope you'll be like Mary. 
Mary's been a role model. She's at every meeting that's spiritual. She never missed a feast of Passover, a tabernacle, or anything else. And now she's in this mess. Boy, that gave the gossips a lot of stuff to talk about. And she looks back and says, well, how many times I've been in the, in the temple and I've heard them read the ninth chapter of, of uh, Isaiah, a virgin shall be with, but I couldn't believe it would be me. Supposing I say that there's another Jackie Pullinger here tonight, do you think so? Is God in the same business? He found a 19-year-old girl with a university degree from a middle-class family that today might be married with a bunch of children and living in a mansion in England and she lives in the rottenest hellhole in the world. She doesn't go out till 11 o'clock at night. She goes down an alley and at the end of the alley, 20 feet is where she sleeps. She, she goes down 10 feet, stamps her feet, claps her hands so the rats won't get in the house when she opens the door. She has to drive them back. Then she goes out and she finds women. Can you imagine there are women in Hong Kong at 60 years of age that have prostituted for 45 years? Do you know who hates Jackie the most in Hong Kong? The professional missionaries. They want so soil their hands. She doesn't say everybody should be like me, but thank God there's a model there. Even the... Well, I'll tell you what happened. One night a bunch of guys came into a meeting place. They threw the chairs through the windows. They smashed the doors and tore the place up, they passed their dung off and picked it up and smeared it all over the walls and then went out. And she came in to see the place rack and ruin and all the chairs broken, all the sacrificial money spent and the place is broken up and, and human excrement on the wall and it stunk like a skunk. All she did was wash it off. The men that did it had a, had a sudden relapse and they went back to one of the greatest bandits in the nation. They went to the den of the worst, rottenest, wicked men that murder and rape. It's their lifestyle and they rob and do every damning thing they can do. And they went back and said to the chief, you know, we got in Jackie's place tonight and we feel bad now. We broke the place up, we broke all the chairs, we broke all the tables, we smashed the windows. And the bandit said, go back and apologize. They said, what? Go back and tell her you're sorry. You, you don't understand. I mean, there's, there isn't a chair to sit on. There isn't a thing. We smash everything that's smashable, we smash. We can't go back to Jackie. She won't forgive us. Here's a man who can cut your throat without spitting, rape your daughter in front of your eyes, steal your money, blast everything you have, and when the, this other rascal says, we can't go back to Jackie, he says, a, a big boss, he says, she won't forgive us. And the bandit says, this, this dirty, filthy man whose hands are running with blood says, go tell Jackie you're sorry, but she won't forgive us. She has to, she's a Christian. Isn't that something and a bandit knows that and we don't know it? Dear God, we get offended because the pastor went twice to one house in the same street and missed us. How easily we're offended are. Yes, yes, yes. It's very nice when she says that little thing inside of me is the redeemer of the world. He's prophet, priest and king. He's the only one the Holy Ghost ever conceived in history and he's the only one that will be conceived that way. Okay, that's very nice. But what would you do when you come to this second chapter in Luke? Listen to this. Verse 34 says, Simeon blessed them and said, Mary, his mother, behold, this child is set for the rising again of many in Israel and for a sign which shall be spoken against, a sword shall pierce through thine own soul. Do you hear that? This woman who had heard over time and time again, she heard the high priest quoting the ninth chapter of Isaiah, but she'd also heard the high priest quote Isaiah 53. What does it say in Isaiah 53? 
How do you remember? Thank you. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. She's bearing the man that's going to bear the sin of the world. She's going to see him on the cross naked. She's going to see a man that walks up and down penniless like precious Jackie does. You talk about prophets. Do you know Plato was a prophet? Do you know Plato prophesied? Long before Jesus was born, Plato said, one day God will come to this world with bare feet. He'll have no home. He'll be a homeless, penniless man and we won't know him. And it came to pass. What do you think people said when they saw the belly on that little girl? Look at the dirty tramp. Messing around with the soldiers. She talks about holiness and gets pregnant. She talks about fasting and there she is. She'll never bring that child. She's too small and everything. They said every damnable thing about her. What did she care? Listen, if you get through with the Holy Ghost, you won't care as a snap of the things about the opinion of people. Whether they like you or hate you, what difference does it make? In that big conference one day, 9,000 people said, let's sing a chorus. Maybe some of you know it. Jesus loves me, this I know. Do you know they went into ecstasy about it? They haven't sung that since 50 years ago. The greatest thing you'll ever learn this side of eternity is Jesus loves me. The Apostle Paul said he loved me and gave himself for me. I don't care if he died for the world. I don't care if he died for the church. He loved me. A bloody man going down the road, my hands running with blood. And he transformed him and made him the greatest man of his day. Maybe the greatest man that ever lived after Jesus Christ. So Mary has a... Would you like God to give you an unveiling of your life from here to the end? Do you know what will happen in another 25 years in America? People will be crucified in the streets for following the Lamb. If you won't join the Roman Catholic Church, they'll burn you to death or something like they've always done. Like they're still doing in South America. That battle is coming up. It's either be totally Christ or be committed to Christ. Or else get tied up with a harlot church. Filled. Mary was filled physically too. But what's the next thing the Holy Spirit does? He comes on a bunch of men and uh, they were gathered together where in the upper room and they were filled with the Holy Ghost, it said in Acts 2.4. But you know, why do we get stuck there? I, I made a quick note of this just yesterday. Oh, we're filled with the Holy Ghost, Acts 2, 4. But it says in the sixth chapter, do you remember what it says about Stephen? He was a man full of what? No, before that. Full of faith. Lots of people are full of the Holy Ghost, but not full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. It says in Philippians 1, we're filled with the fruits of righteousness. Paul prays for the Colossians, they may be filled with the knowledge of his will. How many of you are stumbling around, you don't know which way to go? You young people, I don't know whether God wants you on the mission field, wants me here, wants me there. Find out God's will and do it. Get on a boat and go to Hong Kong or King Kong as far as that goes. As long as you know you're in the will of God, all hell won't stand against you. And then it says in 2 Corinthians 7, 4 that they were filled with comfort. And then in Ephesians 3 and verse 19, you remember that fantastic verse? Well, I'll remind you of it. Ask somebody to preach on it, will you? It's the most stupendous thing I know of this side of eternity. It says, you, 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 a new mortal beings, you can be filled with all the fullness of God. Can you fill what's already full without emptying it? No, yes you can. Okay, I put all the lights out in this room. Or oh, let's say a, a couple of hours ago maybe there wasn't anybody in it and people start coming in. The room was empty, you fill it with people. The room was full of air otherwise they couldn't breathe. Then we put on a switch, we fill it with light. It's full of people, it's full of air, it's full of light. We can turn up the switch and we can fill it with heat. It's full of people, it's full of light, it's full of warmth. And 
I take a spray and I can fill it with perfume. It's filled and filled and filled. Well, that Greek word there, be filled with the Spirit, is actually be being filled with the Spirit. It's not something that happens once, it's continually there. Jesus says, if you abide in me, you don't get your prayers answered simply because you use God as you go shopping. Do you abide in him every day? Does he tell you to go to, the, to a certain place and meditate and he shows you your whole career crucified? You made up your mind to be a lawyer and God says you can't be a lawyer. You make up your mind to get married and God says you can't do that. I went to a conference some years ago, walked up to the front and there were about 800 uh, college people there. And as I bowed in prayer, somebody just grabbed my knee and I looked. That's the most gorgeous girl I've ever seen. I think gorgeous cheeks and bright eyes. And she said, do you remember me? I said, sure I do. I remember you. She said, do you remember you preached on uh, Isaiah 6 one night? Whoa, lo, go. I said, sure, I remember that. She said, well, I went home and the Lord spoke to me. And she said, uh, you said, wait before God. You, you told us of a vision of eternity, a vision of God, a vision of deity, a vision of depravity, a vision of duty. And she said, I went home. And I prayed and God said, now forget all about any courtship. For the next three years, pray and study and meditate. And she, I just said, but Lord, uh, this boyfriend I love, he's the most handsome man in all the university. He won't be single another month. The girls will be after him. I said, what happened? She said, oh, he's wonderful. And she said, look, he's coming. Here comes a man, of course, modern young man, nice moustache, tall, handsome like me, and not like somebody else. And uh, she said, well, Mr. Raymond, I want to tell you something. When I went home that night, I, I made a pledge to God, all right, I'll never talk to a boy again. I'll never have a date with a young man until he release me to meet that fellow. He went home, and the Lord said to him, forget all about that pretty girl for three years. I'll take care of her. And she said, we met just recently. I hadn't dated anybody in three years. He hadn't dated anybody in three years. And each of us said, God has kept us. And so, we're going to get married. So there you are, cancel your relationship with your boyfriend. Not with your husband, just with your boyfriend. But, oh, well, you know, most of us are trying to get, to, we want God's maximum blessing on minimum deposits. And he doesn't do that. God will demand your whole spirit and soul and body, he says. The Spirit of God, have you noticed Jesus never did anything till the Spirit of the Lord was upon him? He knew he was the Son of God when he was 12 years of age, but he waited till he came up out of Jordan. Then what happened? Oh, I want to be filled with the Holy Ghost. You clap your hands, you shout, you have a wonderful time. Wait a minute. You told God you want to be like Jesus. What happened when Jesus was filled with the Holy Ghost? He was immediately led of the Spirit. He wasn't led of the devil. He was led into of the Spirit for 40 days in the wilderness. Are you prepared for that? You can't have God's blessing on your terms. But go read on to the next chapter. He returned in the power of the Spirit. He didn't, he didn't return a nervous wreck. The devil tempted him for 40 days, sexually, everywhere. He was tempted in all points. And the devil never took advantage of him by because he was a God-filled man. How filled was he? Look at Isaiah chapter 11 a minute. Isaiah chapter 11. John 3.34 says what? He was given the spirit without measure in John 3.34. But here in Isaiah 11, listen, there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. Did you hear that? The Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of wisdom, number two. The Spirit of understanding, number three. The Spirit of counsel, number four. The Spirit of might, num might number five. The Spirit of knowledge, number six. And the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge after the sight of the eyes, nor reprove after the hearing of his ears. He shall judge with righteous judgment. Come on, dear friend, don't you wish those things were exercised in your church? That your preachers or your deacons had the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, 
the spirit of power, the spirit of revelation, that we're not fumbling around wondering what's going to happen. But you don't get that by just going to a meeting for one night. Remember, he came out of the ivory palaces into a world of woe. Can you imagine the heaven of heavens cannot contain God, and yet God compresses him into the matrix of a woman? What do you think he felt like in that black chamber of that woman's womb? Read the six of Isaiah, cherubim and seraphim falling down before him he sang tonight. And instead of cherubim and seraphim, he's in a, in a black chamber where nobody talks, nobody hears. He's shut up in the womb of a blessed woman by the name of the Virgin Mary. You see, it's not all strawberries and cream. Oh, I hear people say, oh, I'd like to eat Jackie Pullinger. Would you? Would you like to live in a hell hole like that? Would you like to go down that alley at night and you can't tr step this way because there's a pile of human excrement? You can't step that way because there's blood. Somebody's had half his head cut off. There's a girl there with her breast out trying to feed a baby. There's a man there smoking pot, smoking from a big pipe. Opium, he's been smoking for 50 years. Who wants to live like that? You see, if this happened in Wesley's day or a hundred years ago, you'd say, well, that's a different day. What's different about it? Human nature is the same, isn't it? Isn't pain the same? Isn't murder the same? Isn't drunkenness the same? Why in God's name do we make excuses? Hell is the same. Heaven is the same. I hope to bring your message, burning message, on the judgment seat of Christ. And it will be very painful for me to deliver. It's true, but by the grace of God, I'm going to deliver that. So, uh, holy men of God spake as we were moved by the Holy Ghost. But there's never any, you can be moved emotionally. You go, how many times have you gone to meetings and moved? How many times have you made commitments? Come on. Commit yourself to give a bit more. Commit yourself to pray a bit more. Commit yourself to do this. You can commit yourself a hundred times. How many times does a man get crucified? That's one commitment. Preachers love to say, oh, we had a lovely Sunday morning. People have been coming to the front. It doesn't mean a thing to come to the front anymore. I was raised in a holiness church where at least twice you went to the altar, and that's only twice. When you got saved, in the second time to be sanctified or crucified, if you like. It's not coming every weekend. What, the, what good does it do? I remember preaching in a lovely church in London. I was preaching at the London Keswick. And one day I had to go to town to a plain called Orange Grove. It's a typical church of England, very beautiful. It had stained glass windows and a lovely pulpit. And just before I went in the pulpit, uh, one of the men in the church said, you know, we used to stand at this pulpit. When you grip the pulpit and put your feet down, just say to yourself, I'm standing in the place where Augustus Top Lady stood. Remember, he wrote to him, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. So, boy, when I got in the pulpit, I put my feet down, I held that pulpit tight. And I was singing that one phrase in that hymn, Be of Sin, the Double Cure. Do you know why we've had no revivals? There isn't an evangelist from Billy Graham downward that has a message with a double cure. Wesley says, I went here, I went there, I went to Manchester, I went to London, and I offered men Christ. We don't offer people Christ. We offer them forgiveness. We offer them peace. We offer them forgiveness. We offer them heaven, peace, pardon, and prosperity, the damnable teaching that we have. Oh, well, money is a proof that God is with you, well, the Mafia must be very happy. They must be the most blessed man in the world, the Mafia. If that's a proof of blessing, the Mafia are multi-millionaires. I tell you before God, I, I don't covet the ministry of any man on God's earth right now. If I want to be like anybody, I want to be like Jackie. I said, I'm going to come to Hong Kong, I'm going to sweep the floor there. And one thing I'm going to do, nobody's ever, how many visitors do you have? Oh, with millions, they come sightseeing. The BBC in England sent a whole crew and took pictures and showed it all over the TV space in England. And England was shaken to the roots. And they didn't even go into the wall, city as it's called, where all the vice is. 
Of course, they didn't tell that whole story. But if ever I've seen a person who's consumed in God, it surely is Jackie. I said, Jackie, to me you're the living evidence of 1 Corinthians 13. Love that beareth all things, believeth all things. You've not only gone the second mile, you've gone the 22nd mile. Everybody in Hong Kong know she is to the evangelical world what Mother Teresa is to the Catholics. And Mother Teresa takes hold of you in, I don't know if you saw her in India, she goes and gets hold of dying people in the gutter. Jackie gets hold of people who are going to hell. But she doesn't get publicity. She's got that love that beareth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. She said one night, just she's getting into bed, it was about two in the morning, the phone rang, hello, hello, can I help you? Oh, Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie, I'm in very big trouble. Well, she says, you've seen pictures of these Chinese girls with such lovely faces, and this girl was a, a beauty amongst beauties, and uh, she came to see Jackie before this, and Jackie says, darling, you're, you're exceptionally beautiful. Now, I've been here 30 odd years now. I'll tell you what will happen. Some rich man in this town will come and he'll give you jewels, he'll give you cars, he'll give you servants. Uh, he'll, he'll live like a good husband for a week. And then when he's had his sexual satisfaction, he'll turn you out, he won't want you. Oh, no, 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 no. This man, this man, he wears the nicest thousand dollar suits. He wears the best jewels. He is the richest man maybe in Hong Kong and he wants to marry me. So here she is at two o'clock in the morning. Jackie, Jackie, this is so and so. She could you could you help me? She said, Why? She said, My husband beat me up. I'm all bloody, my lips are swollen, I can't speak. And she said, He says, if I don't take him fifteen hundred dollars by tomorrow night, he'll kill me and I know he will. He's done that thing before. So Jackie, there's nobody in Hong Kong I know has fifteen hundred dollars. And she said, darling, I don't have fifteen. But Miss Jackie, I mean, all the world knows about you. Well, I'm sorry, I don't have fifteen dollars. Well, what can I do? Jackie said, I'll tell you what. What's the deadline? It's tomorrow night at six or whatever it was. She said, all right, don't worry. My God answers prayer. I don't have fifteen dollars, but I'll get you fifteen hundred by tomorrow night. So she went to pray and she said, Lord, what do I do? This girl will be killed. And the Lord said, she'll be killed tomorrow night between six and seven, unless you give her fifteen hundred dollars. What can I do? Well, you brought an old ball from England. She still plays in the uh, Hong Kong Philharmonic to have access to them. Take your old ball, it's an antique. It's worth a lot of money. She goes in town, there's a man, he buys instruments, and he, she says, uh, he says, Jackie, what have you got? She said, I need money, and all I have is this oboe. Oh, he says, that, 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 that's an antique, and uh, that's worth a lot of money, but, uh, well, I, I, I can't really give you what you should have, Miss Jackie, but I will give you $1,500 for it. She said, well, thank you. And she took it to the girl, and the girl, of course, said, well, nobody does anything like that. They just give you tracts and say, Jesus loves you, and they leave you. Another day, she went to see a lady who had about six children, and had any clothes, they drags. And uh, the Lord said, well, you see those girls? She had six girls, and the mother, uh, go to your wardrobe, and she said, I have a, have a little rail in my room. And somebody would give me a bunch of clothes, new clothes, lovely ones. And she said, put your hand by the wall and reach out like that and close all those dresses in and whatever dresses you have in that bunch, give them away. She said, but Lord, they're all new ones. She said, well, that's why I wanted to give them away. So she collected all the clothes up and gave them. Do you wonder it breaks people's heart? Do you wonder she's just, just like Jesus? Okay. But read that chapter, will you, Isaiah 11, when you go home. How's my time going? Clock always goes too fast here. Okay.
holy men moved as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, spake as they were moved. This is not, if I didn't feel I had an anointing before I came here, and I don't wait till I get to here, I've been praying for weeks and weeks and weeks, and God's my witness of it. I go to bed at nine at night, I went to bed at ten o'clock Thursday night, I had a good sleep, and I thought, well, I've had a wonderful night's sleep. Went in the front room, I went to bed at ten, I was refreshed, got up, and it was eleven. So I go to bed at nine, get up at twelve, or one, or two, wait on God, and ask for anointing for meetings like this. Whether you think I'm the best preacher in the world or the worst, I couldn't carry a hill of beans. All I have to do is deliver my soul. Men moved as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Listen, let me tell you, one of two things will happen if you get filled with the Holy Ghost. Either your prayer life will be revolutionized or something else will. Go back to Peter, will you, just for a minute. Would you like to be a preacher? Do you want to know the secret of preaching? Here it is in First Peter, the first chapter. Verse 11, searching water, what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which is in them did signify when it testified beforehand of the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Do you see that? The suffering and then the glory, okay? Unto them it was revealed, but not unto ourselves, and themselves, but unto us they did minister to you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Most preaching today is rhetoric and logic and historic stuff, but there's no true preaching unless the Holy Ghost is upon it. The Holy Ghost is creative. What do we say about Moses? Somebody like Moses, let me just give you one glance of Moses. Here he is in the, what, the 32nd chapter of Exodus. Listen, if you're going to get filled with the Spirit and walk with God, you're going to get an awful lot of disappointments. But look at the uh, 32nd chapter in Exodus. At the end of verse 5 says, Tomorrow is the feast of the Lord. They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and bought peace offerings. The people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go down, for the people which thou hast brought out of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Can you imagine that? Moses is on the mountain having a revelation of God in fire. And the high priest is dancing round a golden calf with half-naked people. And he's the anointed of God. And verse 9 says, The Lord said unto Moses, I have seen this people. They are a stiff-necked people. Now therefore let me alone. Did you ever, ever hear anybody preach that? How many charismatic meetings have you been to? How many conferences? Did you ever hear a man stand up and say, God said, this is the Almighty God. He can do anything. He can create a world by spinning it off the end of his tongue if he likes. He can make a Moses out of a stone. And God says, let me alone. This is not God reaching down and take hold of Moses. It's Moses, re Moses reaching up and taking hold of God. I'd love to pray like that. Until says, God, let me alone. Don't intercede for America anymore. Why do you weep when other people laugh? Why do you fast when other people feed? Why do you live as, as near as you can on the poverty level, have a nice home? Have a garage, it's turned into an office now. But as, as far as, do you remember some young, young people who used to go to Christ, what, what do you call them, Youth of Christ meetings? How many of you used to go to Youth of Christ meetings? Let me see. Oh, you're afraid to show your age. Okay. Do you remember a song that starts, Worldly... Uh, Worldly some things don't enter. I would be like Jesus, be like Jesus is my song. In the home and in the throng, be like Jesus all day long. I would be like Jesus. Worldly fetters shan't enthrall me. 
But why did he watch TV so much? The biggest curse in America or the world is TV. Preaching with the Holy Ghost set down from heaven. Let me give you two quick pictures. Martin Luther, we know, came out of Rome and its bondage and its all its cult and its uh, indulgences. And one day God came to him, but listen, do you know he fought for 15 years to find assurance? 15 years! He said one day in his cell, a devil came and wrote all the sins of Martin Luther on every wall and on the top. And he stopped and Martin Luther says, right. And he says, there's nothing. I've got all the record of your sins. I know every sin you committed as a child, as a youth, as a man. Sins of omission, sins of everything. Every record, every sin of yours is on the walls. There's nothing else to write. And Martin Luther said, write one thing. What is it? It said, write across them all. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. So what did he do? How many people I've watched in Billy Graham's meetings sing 20,000 thousand times at a time? Blessed assurance, Jesus in mind, and they have no assurance. That's, you see, when you pray, do you remember, and I can't, I'll quote the scripture, I get it, it's Romans 9, where Paul prays one of the most amazing prayers, I wish myself accursed. He didn't say it. He says, I call the Holy Ghost to bear witness. How many times do you pray and call the Holy Ghost to bear witness? You're not praying because other people pray. You're not praying because the pastor's there and he may be impressed with your prayer. I mean, are you as excited to pray alone as you are in a meeting? Do you clap your hands when you worship alone or do you just do it publicly? I went to a meeting a while ago to preach. When I got there, there were 1,400 people there. As I came in from the back of the auditorium, there were five, six, five young women. And they were, where the hair was down, they were tossing it this way and going to the ground, touching the ground with the hair, tossing the hand. I know, and they were clapping and singing. It was more than I could take when I got up. I said, listen, you young women there, you're supposed to lead the worship. Do you do that at home in your bedroom or is it an exhibition? I am just there professionally. There's very little real worship, I'll tell you that. I believe the highest form of worship is silence. I can't even speak. I believe the highest form of prayer is, is speechless. Hannah prayed. She's barren and she's reproached. She prayed. Nobody heard her prayer. Her lips moved. And even the man of God didn't understand her. Okay. So, uh, I'm saying this. Martin Luther did not invent the doctrine of justification by faith. He rediscovered it and declared it to the world and shook the world. John Wesley did not invent the doctrine of entire sanctification. He rediscovered it and shook the world. We've had healing meetings, my God, what healing meetings. I preached a number of times in the Carnegie Hall in Pittsburgh. Miss, Miss Kuhlman preached on the Friday mornings and I preached on the Tuesday nights. When she had a healing meeting, there wasn't a room. There was room to stand, that's all. The gallery was packed. When I preached on holiness Tuesday nights, hardly anybody in the gallery. They were all down here. So somebody said one day, why, do, why didn't you take Rainiel on your staff? She didn't want me. I don't care about that. But you see, the same happened with Jesus. Give Jesus, give them loaves and fishes. They ran after him, but when he laid down the conditions, this is the way you answer, blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are the meek. Who wants to go that way? Jesus, the man who said, my kingdom is not of this world, ended up on a cross, stark naked. Oh, the artists don't paint him like that, it's too humiliating, but that was the law. A man must be publicly exhibited there in nakedness, and everybody can curse him, you can throw urine on him, you can spit on him, he has no rights once he's on the cross. And that's the man who leads us into a kingdom. Well, let me tell you something. There's no other way into the kingdom but that way. You've got to sell all you have. You'll have to lose a hundred friends. You'll have to stop feasting and do some fasting. These eyes of yours, you must cut away much good. The tears will come. 
and, and you'll be in trouble. The, the biggest danger you have is becoming more spiritual than your pastor. Isn't that usually the trouble? Oh boy, you can't be more spiritual than the pastor. Okay. Let Moses in the spirit groan. Let, I'm paraphrasing it now from the old Methodist hymn book. Let Moses in the spirit groan. Down there people are worshipping the golden calf. They're dancing naked. The high priest is backslidden. The whole nation's gone whoring after strange gods. And only Moses has a revelation of God. He's been on the mountain. And he lays hold of God for this people. And God says, Moses, let me alone. Listen to what God says. I'll read it quickly to you. And Moses besought God, verse 11, and the Lord said, and, and Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath, thy wrath wax hot against thy people? Now look at verse 22, and Aaron said, let not the anger of my Lord wax hot. What do you mean? Because Moses had been in the presence of God and God was angry. And he taught holy anger. The man that teaches you that the Holy Ghost is only joy and fire, he doesn't know a thing about the Holy Ghost. You'll get angry someday. I get angry. I'm angry now. How much longer do you think God's going to put up with the sin of America? I'll tell you some statistics in a few days, not just about vice. I'll tell you things that we have that no nation in history has ever had. For instance, just one. I checked so I wouldn't make a mistake. You've got some parts of the world like where Jackie says, I go into China and Brother Raymond, there isn't one Bible in the whole town. Do you know we have 600 million Bibles in America? Do you know we have 26 translations of the Bible in America? Do you know in America and Canada between them, we have 450 Bible schools and 250 seminaries? Did Sodom and Gomorrah have a seminary? Did they have a Bible school? It's Nick. America fought World War I in the backyard of Europe. She fought World War II in the backyard of Europe. She fought the Middle East War in the Middle East. She hasn't suffered a thing. I got up one morning and opened the door, looked out, and the neighborhood had disappeared. I looked down the tree, there's a baby up in a tree. There's a man's leg sticking out of the debris. There's a chair leg sticking out there. Why? Because the Germans raided us in the night. America hasn't suffered that much. I'm trying to warn you that we're heading for trouble. I want to let me tell you this, dear friend. With all the churches and everything we have, God, G-O-D, is N-O-T, not on trial. In this critical hour in history, God is not on trial, his church is on trial. And she doesn't have an answer to the problem. We're like Mother Hubbard, her cupboards are there. Where is the supernatural? Do you think Jack isn't filled with God when a woman comes running down the street and kneels in front of her and the woman's all pockmarked? She's prostituted 40 years, and she says tremblingly, Jackie, Miss Jackie, Miss Jackie, please take the devil out of me. I'm full of the devil, and you're full of God. Will you please? And every day of her life almost, she casts out demons. She doesn't even claim to be a Pentecostal. She does claim to be a Christian. I've got the greatest Pentecostal preacher in the world coming to see me in three days. I'm going to ask him a question. I went to the greatest uh, Pentecostal theologians came to see me. I have a stack of his books. And I said, I said I'm said, i just reading the, uh, the history of Azusa Street by Bartleman. And it says on, after the five page, the first page, it says on the second page, there are 70, listen, 70 million spirit-filled Pentecostals in the world today. And I said to him, listen, tell me this. Is this record true? Are there 70 million spirit filled Pentecost? Oh no, Mr. Raymond. Bartleman wrote that five years ago. I said, well, what's, what's, the, what's the story now? He said, and he said without blushing, he said, Mr. Raymond, there are 120 million 
charismatic and old style Pentecostals in the world today. Well, it, it, it was near enough, dear lady, I could almost mark finger his and, and I said, listen, tell me this. I know you've written stacks of books on theology. I know there are 120 Pentecostal churches in Dallas and nobody knows they're there. You had me, he said, no, there are not 70 million Pentecostals. I said, is a Pentecostal a man that's full of the Holy Ghost and speaks in tongues? Yes. He said, there are 120 million of them in the world. I almost knocked his head over, but I said, well, brother, tell me this, were there 120 million in the upper room? Oh, oh, oh no. I said, well, what's the difference between their baptism of the Holy Ghost and yours? Don't tell me it's tongues. Every devout Mormon in Salt Lake City speaks in tongues. It's part of their religion. Spiritists speak in tongues. Who cares a hill of beans if you speak in tongues, if you're bad tempered, if you're jealous, if you get the last ounce of money out of somebody, the last ounce of work out of somebody, come on! We're a million miles removed from apostolic Christianity. And it's not going to come back by big crowds. There's not, I don't think there's not 200 people here tonight. I doubt there's 120 maybe. But supposing God has his way in us. I'm not preaching to the absent people. I'd like Billy Graham to be here. I'd like Oral Roberts to be here. I'd like the Word of Faith guy to be here. They don't know a thing about the Holy Ghost. Every time he says a word, Bob Tilton says, Thus saith the Lord, he's a liar from hell, he doesn't say that. One day he'll stand in judgment and say, Oh, I preached a meeting a while ago, I mentioned some names, I mentioned old Roberts, I mentioned, uh, what do you call him? Uh, little fellow in Baton Rouge. And somebody said, Mr. Rainey, that's not love. I said, listen. I'll be watching you at the judgment seat. I said, you say it's not love. The greatest man that ever lived the life of love, they said, was John. But John didn't write 1 Corinthians 13. A bloody warrior wrote it, a man by the name of the Apostle Paul, that pulled down strongholds. The greatest thing ever said of a man outside of Jesus Christ was said of the Apostle Paul. By who? By demons. When he cast out demon, the demon said, Jesus we know and Paul we know. Come on, are you known in hell? I don't care who knows me. I know people think I'm a fanatic. People say you're the last of the line. Your old friend tells us dead. Uh, what, was it? what was the great Baptist? I've forgotten his name, he's died. But I'm not going to die yet just to make you happy for sure. I'm going to hang around a bit more. Isn't it something when demons say, Jesus we know and Paul we know. Come on young preacher, are you ambitious, ambitious to be known in hell? What's it going to be known anywhere else? You preach better than Billy Graham, you preach better than so and so, so what? But you can't have the Holy Ghost without revolution. He's going to fill you as you fill Mary. He's going to let you see things. Suffering that's going to come to others and to you may be okay. Let me just say, and you know this, some of you are preachers. There's a great deal of contention about the second blessing. I don't know if you've seen a book, if you haven't, it's out again, I think, called uh, greater experiences of famous Christians. There isn't one of them in the list that didn't have a second crisis. One of the most amazing men we've forgotten about was George Fox. And George Fox was filled with the Holy Ghost. He had to go to prison very often. He's going down the street one day. God says, take his shoes off. So he took them off and shoved them under the hedge. Raise your hand and walk through town. Shout at the top of your voice. Go on to Litchfield, thou bloody city. And when Martha and I used to go through, I used to say, Martha, George Fox went through this city with his hands raised. He made leather breeches because he's always wearing his trousers out. He went through the city crying, War unto Litchfield, thou bloody city. Some months after, he pulled up at a house at night. They were expecting him to dinner. 
and uh, the master of the house said, uh, the maids are not ready yet, and the chef in a big house, he said, would you, would you please sit in my library and read a little? So George Fox went in, he took down one of those big tomes, they were all leather bound, you know, big things, and he took the book down and opened it, and as he opened it, he saw in big letters, Old English, Litchfield. And he thought, well, that's where I walked through the city, barefoot, crying, worn to Litchfield, how bloody city. But why did God let me open here? So he opened at Litchfield, and he read what it said there. Two hundred years before George Fox walked through that town, two hundred Christians were martyred. They were put to death in the very marketplace where he went. And God says to him, their blood crieth from the ground through you. What an experience. And we get blessed if you just sing a song and they sang my fetch, so what? If you go out of this meeting and you came in, I'll be disappointed and God will. Okay, let me prove to you forever as far as I'm concerned. Maybe tomorrow night we'll sing a hymn, I was going to sing it tonight, so don't, don't have it before we start tomorrow night. Because he lives, you know that wonderful song? Isn't that great? Let's sing it. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear, all fear is gone. <coughs> I know. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Oh, you can sing it again. You almost got it. Because <laughs> Sing it. I can face tomorrow because I believe the most disappointing day in the life of Jesus you see when he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men the Holy Ghost has no gifts the gifts were purchased by Jesus the Holy Ghost dis disperses those gifts okay Jesus rose from the dead what did he do he led captivity captive he went into hell and declared his triumph over death and sin and the devil and when he came out of the, the tomb on the resurrection morning, there wasn't one person there. How many of you like opera? Do you remember Verdi's Aida? You don't remember it? Oh, well, when Verdi uh, celebrated his Aida, the first time he played it was in the, uh, uh, what do they call it? The Theatre in Milan. Anyhow, it's one of the biggest theatres in the world. And when he finished, they were so excited, I think at the end of it, the heroine lay dead, and they went out clapping and shouting and whistling at 10 o'clock at night. And they unhitched the horses from his chariot, and men pushed his chariot down to the hotel, and they were still yelling at 4 o'clock in the morning, Verdi, 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 clapping, shouting, whistling for five hours. When Jesus rose from the dead, there wasn't a person there. Peter wasn't there. John wasn't there. It must have been disgusting for Jesus. The greatest triumph ever. Because he lives at the right hand of the Father tonight. Every Sunday we preach sermons uh, we're preaching 80% of the, 90% of the sermons we preach were about a man who lived 2,000 years ago. And the other 10%, 80%, 8% are about somebody who may come today or tomorrow. 
Only it matters not where he was 2,000 years ago, where he will be, where is he now? Do you realize he's been trained for 2,000 years and he isn't tired? But how long, much longer is he going to do it? Let me take you through this very quickly now. Can I do that please? Tie this thing up. Look at the end of the gospel recorded by Luke. Read verse 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And he said, thus it is written, thus it is believed to suffer, that Christ must suffer and rise the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among the nations. And the witnesses of the... And behold, listen, listen now. I send you the promise of my Father, but tarry. Now in one breath he says, go. In the other breath he says, tarry. What had happened? They'd seen Jesus, they gave him a piece of honeycomb to eat. They had breakfast with him, they talked with him, they listened to him, they saw him, they touched him. Well, isn't that enough? Can't you go into all the world and preach the gospel? And somebody says, well, how do you know Jesus is alive? Because I gave him a piece of my honeycomb, because I shook hands with him, because I touched him, because I heard him pray. No, that's not enough. That's number one miracle. The second is this. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continuing in the temple, leaping and praising God. Do you see that? The two most stupendous things. One, he's risen from the dead, and then while they're watching him, just as he reversed nature to come into the world without a father, he, reverts, he reverses the law of gravity and he goes up. They'd seen him risen from the dead, they break bread with him, they had meat with him, they had honeycomb with him, and now they see him going up. Isn't that enough? Do you think a thousand demons could say, you never did talk to Jesus, you never did eat with him? But Jesus says, you need more than some emotional stirring, you need the Holy Ghost. Well listen friend, if they needed the Holy Ghost, how much do I need it? Do you know that I think our evangelism today is very much like a man trying to swim up Niagara, Niagara Falls with his boots on? What chance would he have? I get invitations all over the world. Some of them I'll go to, some I won't. I don't have price tags. They offer me a thousand dollars to preach for an hour. I've turned that down to preach for half an hour. I'm not concerned about traveling here. Right now I could go to about 10 countries. I want to be where God wants me to be. Somewhere the fire of heaven is going to fall. People are going to go out totally transformed without one desire to be known, without one desire to have an increase of anything. There's not a preacher in the world I envy. I'd like to go to Jackie's place. I may go this year. She begged me to go. I want to teach her staff, that's all. I want to sit with the staff. I want to talk with the poor people. I want to talk with young men who've been to prison 20 times. Girls who've been harlots, or women harlots for 40 years have been transformed by the power of God. There's a whole bunch of them. You can't show me a Bible school in America has them. Christ for the nations doesn't have them. Oral Roberts doesn't have them. Oral Roberts says he's 4,000 kids full of the Holy Ghost that's a life from hell. He hasn't. How can you have 4,000 people full of the Holy Ghost in the city be the same? Only a hundred and twenty fill with the Holy Ghost. God is still in the business. One thing I'm through. I preached in Louisville a while ago. There was a man in Louisville just about a hundred years ago. had the largest congregation in Louisville. His name was A.B. Simpson. He founded the Christian Missionary Alliance. He had a five-figure salary. That was as much as the President of the United States got. He had a chariot, a, a horse and carriage. He had a big home. And one day he got, met God in a new way. He wrote that hymn, you know, once it was a blessing, now it is the Lord. Once it was a feeling, now it is his word. Once his gifts I wanted, now the giver owned. Once for self I labored, now himself alone. 
And then he goes on. He's told his courage, gave of that big congregation, went to New York and bought a piece of land. And I preached in the tabernacle. It's, it's taken down now, I think. In 1950, I preached there. Seats about 2,000. They built that place and had a Holy Ghost revival. But it cost him everything he had. His wife didn't understand him. She didn't agree with him. You've been to university. You've got scholarship. You're the best preacher in town. You have the biggest crowd. You have plenty of money. Why give it all up? Because Jesus did that for me. I've got to go. And as a result of that, now you have 1,200 missionaries all over the world through one man. Moved by the Holy Ghost. The woman is moved on by the Holy Ghost. She gives birth to the most remarkable babe that ever lived. There's a bunch of men nervous in the upper room. No, they were not. What does it say? They waited in the upper room. They were filled with joy. They went, they said, he's risen and he's ascended to heaven and he's going to send us the Father's gift, the Holy Ghost. And they waited. What do you think they did each day? They said, well, we've been waiting 40 days. We've only 10 more to go. They knew how many days they had to wait. And it came down to the last day. How do you think they got up that morning? And then suddenly the Holy Ghost. Well, when the Holy Ghost came on Mary, she gave birth. When the Holy Ghost came on them, they gave birth. They went out. They turned the world upside down. They didn't have any financial backers. They didn't ask for offerings. When you've gone, what did John Wesley, Charles Wesley said, Thou old Christ, that's all I want. The only time you can say Christ is all I need is in when Christ is all you have. How can you say Christ is all I need? You have $50,000 in the bank. When you know people are suffering. Full of faith. Full of the Holy Ghost. No room for anything else. No room for pride. No room for greed. No room for promotion. No room for ambition. No more desire to be known I want God that's all I can't I wish I could I can't revise, recite the verse uh, I used to have it in my Bible wait a minute no I don't have it I thought I had it but there's a hymn I'll finish with it my goal is God himself not joy not peace not even blessing but it's thee my God and then it finishes up by any road at any cost are you prepared tonight? I'm not going to ask you to come here. You've come out. How many times have you been to the front and wept and groaned and committed this and committed that? Forget it. Go to your room tonight and die. A wealthy preacher was at Jackie's not long ago. He had a three-piece suit and he sat there and he said, Jackie, you see my case there? She said, yes. He said, I've got ten lectures in there. I passed to one of the largest churches in America and I'll be here for a number of days. I'd like to teach you, I'd like to take you, young man, I'll give them exactly the same teaching I've given for ten weeks to our young preachers. Ten lectures on leadership. And she said, you see that? He said, of course, that's the door. She said, well, get through it. <laughs> we don't want men to come and teach us leadership. We want you to teach us to die. She said, don't you realize China's going to come down? What, in seven years, Hong Kong goes to China? It'll be a bloodbath. And the young men there know that. That's why I want to go and share with them. Well, I have enough energy. They know they're going to be martyred. She said one of the choruses of the young China girls, they had their clothes, their rags, and they sit there clapping and saying, Oh Lord, let's be martyrs for Jesus. Let's die for Jesus, not to live and get married. Not win the tennis championship or something. Let's die for Jesus. She said we'll have the most remarkable group of young people not coming out of Bible college in America or England, but these young people have already counted the cost and say, I'm ready to die physically. That there may be an outpouring of the Spirit. There can't be an outpouring any other way. I know some of the young prophets, you know them, Rick, John and others, they're building a house now for the prophets. 
They may do that, but you can't build a house for God. He dwelleth not in temples made with hands. I preached the other week there, and across the road from me was preaching who? Bob Shuler in his $17 million crystal palace. Do you think people take notice of that? He put a bell tower up now, $5 million. Who takes notice of it? The devil isn't afraid of it. The devil is afraid of men full of the Holy Ghost. Men who have no vision but a vision for God and vision for holiness and a passion for the lost. Two days ago we saw our precious daughter-in-law go back to South America. She's one of the greatest women in the world today. She's another Jackie Pullins on another level. She's a school teacher. She speaks a number of languages. But she has revelation of God like nobody I know in this world. And her husband been battling it down where there's a mixture of voodooism and Catholicism in South America. She's a challenge for me every moment that I see her. Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find, says Wesley. Can you really say that to me? I'm not going to, I'm not going to sing a hymn and stir you emotionally. I'm asking you to go home or go to your hotel and get alone and think over this message. Read again and say, Lord, I want to be moved by the Holy Ghost. Listen, if he's going to come in, other things have to go out. Every area of you which is unclean, he will purge. Every obstruction he'll take away and he'll come. And from today, you'll have divine wisdom and divine understanding, divine strength. Father, as we sit in the comfort of this lovely place, we go to our homes or hotels. We do remember these precious people in China. Pray tonight you'll bless Jackie. Give her a new inspiration this weekend. We pray for these young people who have already agreed that they're willing to die for Christ's sake. These young people who walk for an hour or two hours at six in the morning to pray and then walk home two hours and they have no breakfast. They've nowhere to have a nice warm shower. They have to stand in the middle of a village and get a bucket of water for the rest of the day. Lord, here we are. We're drowning in our creature comforts. Oh God, give us an appetite greater than our appetite for food, our appetite for fellowship. Keep your hand upon us. Bless these precious folk. Lord, may we be able to say as we leave this place tonight, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Give us a glorious day tomorrow. Rend the heavens and come down. In Jesus' name.